be having me. <laughs> um, yeah, there's always uh, some snafus with the technology, but um, yeah, uh, the book's been out since July now, and I've given a few talks. I think the, the last one was for Little Rock, so this is my first Fayetteville audience, so that's very cool, and obviously it's a University of Arkansas Press book, um, so, you know, so just to talk a little bit about how this project began, um, I worked in Arkansas for about three and a half years. I was working at the uh, University of Arkansas Little Rock Center for Arkansas History and Culture, and I came there in 2012. I had lived in the South for a while, but had never been to Arkansas before I moved there. And when I got there, I was working in the archives. And if you've ever been to the, that location, Little Rock, they share space with the public library. So there's a lot of great material there. So you've got the public library, you've got the university archives. And I was wrapping up work on my first book, which came out in 2014. So it was kind of the final stages of that. So I was already thinking about what to do for a second book. And since I was in Arkansas, I wanted to write about a big Arkansan. And there are a number of candidates I could have written about. Um, I didn't necessarily want to write about somebody that was maybe still alive. Uh, obviously the Clintons are huge in Arkansas. You've got all the great music and everything. But I was lucky to have found some really great archival, um, really treasures in, in the archive there audiovisual stuff. We had audio of the 1968 concerts he did with, uh, he did for Winthrop Rockefeller. There are these photographs. Um, so there's a lot of great material. And it kind of started with one photograph I didn't know anything about, which is Johnny Cash uh, with June. And um, I probably didn't even know who Rockefeller was yet, but I found this picture of the three of them that made its way into the book. And I was thinking, you know, uh, there's no information on the photograph. I wondered what, where is Cash? Um, I knew it was with June, so it was probably at a concert, but I was wondering uh, when I found out it was Rockefeller, I, I wanted to know, you know, what is he doing there? Uh, what's going on in this picture? So in a way, it kind of started with that one photograph, and I learned that the photograph was of Cash and June and Rockefeller at Cummins Prison Farm in 1969 took a little while to figure this out, but they have the Rockefeller collection there, which is really big. So there's a lot of material in there. The more I went through it, the more information I discovered. So it really kind of began with the Cummins Prison Concert, which I'm going to talk about a little more. But this is the only time that Cash played for prisoners in his home state. We know about the Folsom Concert. We know about San Quentin. We know a lot about Johnny Cash, but I felt like his story of what he was doing in Arkansas was not quite getting the amount of attention that it deserved. And kind of slowly but surely, I started researching, writing about it, and it kind of grew into a book, but it uh, took a while to get to that stage. There are a couple of chapters I wanted to write first. Um, but the more research I did, the more I realized that Cash was very active in his home state, even when he was famous. He would come back to do shows, um, talked about Cummins, but there's a very important concert he does in Fayetteville in 1968, which I'm going to talk about. Um, but um, there are a lot of concerts that he does in his home state. He comes back to visit uh, a number of times to either hang out with his family or go fishing or hunting or whatever. So he kept coming back throughout his career, which I found to be very interesting. But when I realized I maybe had a couple chapters to write about, um, then I, I said, well, this is getting to be a big project. Maybe I'll just turn this into a book. Um, but I wanted to really kind of flesh out his early life in Arkansas because he's, he's born in Arkansas in 1932 in Cleveland County a small town uh, called Kingsland. So he's born there. He spends his first 18 years in Arkansas before he goes off to the military. So uh, as I'm doing a lot of 
you know, research in the archives, research in books and online, whatever I could find. I also kind of wanted to do a little bit of method acting, if you will. I wanted to go to where Cash was born, which was Kingsland. I wanted to go to Dias, where he spent most of his childhood. He left, he left Kingsland when he was, he was pretty young. So I wanted to go there. Um, I mean, you don't necessarily have to do this as a historian, but I like to do this. I mean, I'm also a Civil War historian. I like to go to battlefields. So I like to see where things have happened, even if it's changed a whole heck of a lot, like some places have. But Kingsland, maybe not so much. Um, and it's still a it's still a very small town. Cleveland County is still pretty tiny comparatively. And if you've ever been down there, it's about an hour or so from Little Rock South. So I went, that was the first kind of stop on this pilgrimage, uh, my Johnny Cash pilgrimage. And I actually went down there on my birthday and I think it was 2013. So that was interesting. There's not a whole, I, I think they're working on a museum now. But at the time, there wasn't a whole lot to see. I mean, his house is long gone. Um, I think there's maybe a marker there that says where the house was. Um, but he was born in basically a dirt floor shack. So there, there was, it was not built to last. Um, but it was important to me because I just kind of want to get a sense of the place. And especially when you compare it to Dias, which is a Mississippi County north Eastern Arkansas, a um, couple hours from Little Rock, it's north of Memphis. Um, so I wanted to you know, kind of be on the ground, see what the landscape looked like, and not just to you know, get, get a sense of what's going on, but um, I mean, this is part of the research. So if you look at a place like Dias, it's changed a lot from Johnny Cash's time. And unfortunately, we can't see it the way that he saw it when he was there. Or at least we wanted to kind of get a sense of it and, you know, see the cotton fields. Um, and it is quite a bit different from King from Kingsland, uh, which is kind of more smaller farms um, and all that. So Kingsland was my first stop, and that became the first chapter of the book, which I I kind of skipped around in doing this book. I did, you know, a lot of research on his early life when I was in Arkansas, because I think that was more dependent on Arkansas sources because one of the good things about Arkansas history and also kind of one of the frustrating things is that there's not, a, I mean, it's still a very under, understudied state. I mean, even the Civil War, um, there's so many gaps in our knowledge in Arkansas. I mean, there's been a lot of you know genealogical work and things like that, but in terms of you know, academic books, uh, heavy duty scholarship, you know, some people tend to focus more on the 20th century, um, maybe the Civil War. But my story, there, there were some good sources, but a lot of them probably I couldn't have gotten outside of Arkansas or would have been a lot harder. So um, I was glad I had that time when I was in Little Rock to do a lot of this research. Um, and you know, the Dia story, I didn't know much of anything about, um, but I wanted to, before he gets to Dias, he's only three years old, um, he's, he's raised in Kingsland, which, like I said, hasn't, you know, gotten much bigger from, from when Cash was there, but I wanted to start the story there, I mean, kind of appropriately as a sort of biography is what this is, I wanted to start in Kingsland in 1932, and just kind of set the stage with his family's background, the history of the area, because even though Cash moves away when he's very young, um, a lot of things that are happening in Kingsland are gonna be carried over into his later life. Um, a lot of his love of history, you know, he, he'll be reading about it later, but you know, the history of the Civil War in Arkansas, it's important in Kingsland. Um, this whole kind of, um, well, the, the family problems in terms of poverty, uh, his father not being able to really make much of a living uh, when they're in Kingsland. He's, he's a sharecropper. He's doing odd jobs. He's doing all these things. So I wanted to kind of start, you know, even before the caches get there, because there's still some uncertainty about you know, why they moved there. 
uh, when they moved there. Cash wrote a lot of things in his own writing, uh, his memoirs about the background of the family. Some of it's pretty good, some of it's a bit flawed. So I, you know, got on Ancestry, did a lot of genealogical research, uh, not just his, his parents, but their parents and so on, going back to even before the Civil War. So, you know, some people who <laughs> are reading this book and they want Arkansas might think there's not enough Arkansas. Then there's the other people who think there's maybe too much Arkansas in this book that want the stories about cash going crazy, trashing hotels and, you know, doing drugs and all that. I mean, there's a little bit of that. But again, just because Arkansas tends to be so understudied, just talking about the Civil War, talking about the antebellum period, talking about this migration um, is, is really important to the, the overall story. Because um, when the Civil War breaks out, Arkansas is a pretty new state. It's one of the smaller Confederate states, but it has a large slave population. It's by the standards of the time is doing pretty well in terms of its economy. So it's not necessarily this dirt poor place the way it's been portrayed in a lot of other books or movies or whatever, um, that it was in a lot of ways kind of a thriving place before the Civil War. Problem is the war sets Arkansas back and sets the South back. So this story is kind of really, I mean, it hangs over Arkansas, it hangs over the South, but also kind of hangs over Cash's family history too, because he's growing up in this, this poor place. His father can't really make it. And so eventually they get the opportunity to go to Dias. And that is um, a real transformative moment for Cash and for the family. Cash is very young. He claimed to remember the trip up there and the truck that they took. It was cold, it was icy. Um, he remembered his mother singing a song in the back of the truck, it took him two days to get up there. So I'm, I'm trying to weave in kind of all these stories. Um, and, and Dias, I mean, is, is really kind of its own book in a way too, because it's a very unusual depression era community in the sense that it's, it's government sponsored. And Cash liked to say that he grew up under socialism, which is not entirely the, the case, but there is some truth to that. There were cooperative elements in Dias where you know people were involved in the the dais store, um, nothing was free though. Um, it wasn't you know socialism the way we think of it today. The government um, would charge you for your. I mean, you had to pay for your house. You had to pay for the trip up. So if, if farmers weren't hardworking and they couldn't make it um, growing crops, they weren't really going to make it in dais. So when the caches are there. Uh, we're talking mid 30s into the 1950s. Um, a lot of families are moving in, others are moving out. So for some people it's a success, other people it's not so much. But for the caches, they're able, they're able to make a go of this. And they get 20 acres of land initially with some very unimproved land. I mean, most of it they had to clear themselves no tractors, no heavy equipment, it's Ray, it's Johnny, it's his older brother, Roy. Um, I mean, Cash is still really young, so he can't do all that much initially. But they have to you know, clear the farm, get rid of the trees, get rid of the stumps, get rid of the water um, so that they can grow cotton. And so, you know, the survival of Dias and survival of the Cashes depends on cotton when they're there. And even though it's the depression, they're doing fairly well by the standards of the time. So this is kind of another thing I wanted to emphasize that even though it's the depression and by most middle-class 21st century standards, they're, they have no running water, they don't have uh, electric, electricity initially, um, there's no you know, indoor, indoor plumbing um, for a long time. So, you know, it seems to us it's, it's, they're, they're poverty stricken, but, I mean, compared to what they had in Kingsland, this is really kind of a step up. So I wanted to sort of put a you know, more positive spin on their experiences there. They do stick it out. They stay during the Great Depression. They stay during World War II. And it's not really till after Johnny goes to Memphis that um, they decide they wanna leave. And eventually they're gonna go out to California, at least um, 
Cash's parents are going to go out to California to live with them there. But these these early chapters are are um, are, are really important. And again, if <laughs> you're expecting the usual biography with Cash, I don't think I get to Memphis until page eighty or even even later. So there's a lot of background, a lot of context for the story, and again, a lot of things that. Are not necessarily not necessarily emphasized by other historians. If if you read a biography of Cash, it usually kind of jumps in um, to his music career the first ten or fifteen pages. So um, I had kind of a different agenda with that, but I didn't want to spend forever on on the early years. You know, what, I do want to get to the music, but Dias is important because this is where Cash is absorbing all kinds of music. I mean, he's listening to the radio all the time. And it's not like now where you have XM, you have outlaw country, you have jazz, you have hip hop, whatever. Like you can listen to the same thing all day. He didn't know what was going to be on. Um, and this, I think it was the case for a lot of us growing up. You turn on the radio and whatever was on was on. But even more kind of diverse in a lot of ways than what we grew up with. But he's listening to everything. He's listening to... Uh, a little bit of blues. He's listening to you know, show tunes and pop standards, whatever was big at the time. And absorbing all of this, he's absorbing, you know, the music of the church. Um, his mother played piano. His older brother, Roy, he was, we're talking more of the 50s, but he, he was a musician in Memphis. So there, there's a really diverse plate that Cash is drawing off of. Um, he's not really playing guitar in Dias. That was another thing I kind of wanted to make clear that he's not walking around with a guitar all the time. But he picked it up a few times and maybe had a few lessons, but he didn't really have a guitar until he was in the Air Force. But he is singing. He wins the singing contest when he's in school. Uh, wins it was a five or ten dollars or whatever, which was a big deal for him at the time. So he's expressing all these creative ideas and you know he's learning how to sing he's learning a lot about music and it's really coming from all over the place and another thing about Arkansas again which I think is important is that you know Arkansas itself has very different parts to it I mean you've got the mountains in the western part you've got the delta you've got you know the southwest so it's kind of more like Texas um, you know, Little Rock is what is it is what it is in the middle of the state, but there's like these very different geographical regions with different types of music coming at cash. So there's kind of a little bit of the Ozarks, you know, a lot of the Delta and kind of a lot of the country coming out of Texas. Um, and you know, the Grand Old Op the Grand Old Opry, he's he's hearing that on the radio too. So radio is just such a huge part of his life growing up. He's not buying records necessarily. He's just listening to the radio. Um, so Dias is important, not just for the economics of it and the, and, the, and the New Deal depression story, but this is where cash is kind of filling up. He's, you know, by the time he gets to the Air Force, he's, he's ready to start playing seriously. And so um, when he does start playing a lot of music and writing his own songs at Sun and beyond, he's drawing not just on all these different sounds that he's heard in Arkansas, but his Arkansas experiences too. And one that I definitely want to mention, and I do talk about in the book, but is that, that's the 1937 flood, which, you know, devastated Dias in a lot of ways. I mean, it didn't ruin the Cash's house, but they had to leave because of the flood. And Cash writes a song about this later called Five Feet High and Rising, one of his, on one of his early uh, Roots albums in, in the late 50s. It's, after, it's just after he's left Sun. Um, but he's, once he kind of leaves Sun, even though he's written all this great rockabilly music, he starts writing more about his, his personal life, well, maybe not personal life, but his, his, uh, his background and his kind of upbringing. He doesn't talk about Arkansas specifically in Five Feet High and Rising, but anyone that knows the Cash story, it's it's obviously about that. Um, it's only two minutes, <laughs> and so he says a lot in two minutes. And um, I worked with a guy 
Little Rock, who was a musician, and he actually thought Five Feet High and Rising was Cash's best song, which uh, that's a good choice. I don't know if I agree necessarily, but that's certainly a good choice. Um, but Cash will play this song for years and years. And um, usually when he played in concert, he'd kind of tell this story about what happened in Arkansas in 1937, about him getting on the train and them going down to uh, the Kingsland area until the waters receded, his dad staying behind to make sure nobody looted the house or whatever, although the dad, his dad did have to leave too. Um, but obviously this, this made a huge impact. I mean, Cash is only about five when this happens, but he obviously never forgot this and wrote about it later. So this is just kind of an early example of, of Cash drawing on Arkansas. There are even earlier ones at Sun, but uh, he will do this throughout, throughout his career. So I just, I just, I didn't want to just set the stage for what he does at Sun. It, it really lasts up until the last music he's making. He keeps, he keeps either talking about Arkansas or reworking things that he heard for the first time in Arkansas. So it just has a really profound effect uh, on his music and his career. So that's, that's kind of the, the, really the point of this book. I mean, it's, it's, it's trying to get Arkansas more at the center of his story. And as I've put it in the past, really reclaim cash for Arkansas, because I, I mean, maybe people don't know a lot about cash. They might think he's from Tennessee. They might think he's from Nashville. Um, so I wanted to, to, take him back in a way. And <laughs> it's not just me. I think there, there's been a lot of help, uh, like people, the people at Arkansas State in terms of renovating his house and turning that into a museum has been huge because um, his Nashville house isn't there anymore. There's a, there's a cash museum in Nashville, but the house he had in Hendersonville burned down um, and there's just you know a few relics left of it, but um, that's gone. So I think if you really kind of want to, not to sound too dramatic, but if you kind of want to have a mystical experience and you're a Cash fan, you got to go to Dias. Um, go late in the day, the sun's going down. Like when I first got there, you can you can see the entire sun just kind of go down because there's nothing around you. There's no trees or hills or anything. Um, so yeah, this is sort of my small contribution to take Johnny Cash back from Tennessee. <laughs> Even though he gets to start in Memphis and he settles in Nashville, you know, he's, he's truly in Arkansas. So that's, that's what I'm arguing throughout. But um, I, you know, again, I wanted to kind of represent all the, all the major parts of his career. You could go on and on about the music he does as a son. I mean, that's, that's essential. That's where he gets his start. Uh, if you've seen Walk the Line, you know the story. He auditions for Sam Phillips, doesn't go great initially. Uh, he, he can't get in the door, but then he finally auditions and, and Sam Phillips likes him. And I, I can't get into all that great music he does at Sun, but it's, it's really an amazing run he has. I mean, he's only there a couple of years. Uh, he's writing a ton of songs, more than, you know, certainly more than Elvis, nothing against Elvis, but, uh, you know, Cash was a pretty prolific songwriter when he was at Sun. And again, I wanted to kind of put that all in context, kind of what Memphis is like at the time. I think it's a musical culture that probably is gone forever. I mean, that you can walk into a studio, you've never, you know, you're not, you're not signed. You don't have an agent, you have a representation. Cash just walks in there, Sam Phillips likes him. And then before you know it, he's recording. And within about a year, he's got hit records. So I, I guess something like that could happen today, but this is sort of the golden age of, you know, the, <laughs> to put it bluntly, the American white male who can kind of do whatever he wants. I mean, Cash, very talented guy, really no question about that, but just sort of this Memphis story is just, it's phenomenal. I mean, it's not just Cash, it's Elvis, it's Jerry Lee, it's Roy Orbison, it's Sonny Burgess, it's all these guys just sort of coming together at one time. Um, we, we probably will never see anything like that. Uh, I don't think anything ever happened like, like that before. So his timing is really good, his town is really good, but he's not there at Sun for very long. So 
talk about his time in the military where he's he's starting to play. Um, he's playing with his friends in the in the barracks. He's writing back to his fiance about uh, you know bands that he likes and music that he likes. Um, but you know, it's it's really it's that sun in Memphis where it all happens. So I wanted to devote a lot of time to, to that and not just talk about cash, but also talk about the band because I think the band is is so crucial. I mean, obviously they are, but I think you know. Uh, Luther Perkins adds a lot to the Cash sound. It's very limited in a lot of ways, but he's very kind of distinctive. Inspired a lot of musicians to play. He inspired Bob Wooten, who Cash is going to discover in Fayetteville in '68. So again, I'm I'm trying to just bring in a lot of threads here. Talk about Cash. Talk about his band. Talk about Carl Perkins. Not just because he's another Sun guy, but he and Cash will become pretty close. They write blue suede shoes together, and Cash uh, will tour with will tour with um, Perkins for for a while. Um, later in the '60s, when Cash is sobered up and Carl Perkins is doing a little better, they tour a lot um, after Luther Perkins dies. They're not related. Carl Perkins, Luther Perkins, just a coincidence. Um, but uh, Carl Perkins fills in for for uh, a while with Cash. And he, Carl Perkins is, is at these 1968 concerts, which I talk about quite a bit. And the 68 chapter was really, that's kind of not necessarily where I started with the book, um, but the Rockefeller period was really crucial to the writing in this book because I talked about the Cummins concert, that's 69, but the 1968 concerts, Cash, plays for Winthrop Rockefeller at a number of shows. Um, he plays in Fayetteville, he plays in Monticello, uh, sorry, Monticello, I'm thinking Virginia Monticello. <laughs> he plays in Monticello, he plays in Winthrop as a small town out west. He's playing a, a number of dates with Rockefeller because Cash liked Rockefeller's stance on the prisons. And by this time, uh, when Rockefeller is governor, He's coming in just after the, the major prison scandals break. It was, um, it's a long story. It's its own book, but essentially um, Fabus was kind of sitting on a report that the state police did on brutality and um, you know, corruption in the prisons comes out just as Rockefeller is taking over. So he has one of, one of the major things he has to deal with as governor is reforming the prisons, which were really bad by any standard. But Cash, he does full, he does the famous Folsom concert in 68. He does the album, which is huge. A few months later, um, Rockefeller invites him to play in Arkansas and Cash liked Rockefeller's stance on the prison. So Cash is really riding this wave of, of popularity, but also prison reform. And Cash by 68 is more sober than he was for a while, not completely 100% sober. And he would have major a major relapse later, but he's in pretty good shape uh, by 68. Um, things were bad for a long, long time. Um, almost killed himself in a number of ways uh, with the drug addiction and the crashing of cars and everything. Uh, but by 68, he's doing pretty well. He goes into Arkansas. He's playing these dates. Unfortunately for him and the band, Luther Perkins dies in this, uh, he has a house fire and Luther Perkins dies in that fire in August of 68. So Cash does not have his original lead guitar player and Carl Perkins is filling in. He's a great guitarist, but um, in Fayetteville, September 68, Cash is doing a show for the governor Huge crowd there, five, 10,000 people. And there's this guy, this young guy from Oklahoma, originally from Arkansas, but he's in, he's in Tulsa at the time. This guy named Bob Wooten. And Wooten was a musician. He was a cash fanatic. He, he played in bands, knew Luther Perkins' guitar parts backwards and forwards. And, and another thing that would probably almost never happen today, cash at the Fayetteville show, um, because of bad weather, his drummer isn't there, 
Carl Perkins isn't there. So Cash goes on stage, which is him uh, and his drummer, which is kind of weird, acoustic guitar and a drummer. But June is there too, so she can she can help out. Um, and she plays some songs, but it's not the Cash band. It's not the Cash sound. So uh, Bob Wooten gets the attention of June and Cash basically says, okay, you know my songs? Well, plug in and let's see what you can do. And Bob Wooten nails it. So there he is on stage with his hero, <laughs> never played with Cash before, had driven all the way from, Oak or he, he, he hitched a ride all the way from Oklahoma to see this show. And um, he does great. There's audio footage of this that was in the Little Rock archives that if anyone had heard it, I, it had been a long time. So one of the things I had to get out in the world was this audio, you can hear it on YouTube, but if I wanted to do anything in this book, I had to tell this Bob Wooten story because it was such a cool story. And Bob was, was such kind of an unassuming guy. Um, but for this to happen, it's like any fan's dream. I mean, the only thing I that's comparable, um, you know, one time the Who, Keith Moon passed out at a concert and they let a guy come up on stage and play drums for a couple songs. Other than that, I can't think of anything quite like this. And they didn't hire that guy full time. I mean, Bob Wooten's hired full time and he plays for 30 years with cash. So just an incredible story I, I had to tell. So I had to get that in there. And again, I wanted to highlight what the band is doing because it's not just their musical contributions, it's sort of their background too. And Bob Wooten being from Arkansas, I'm like, great. I can put Wooten in. <laughs> he fits in perfectly. He's more of an Ozarks guy. Um, but again, working class background, loved country music. So I was like, okay, perfect. Got to tell this Bob Wooten story. So that was really great and fun. And I have a picture again, I'm sorry, we don't, we don't have the photos up, but, um, there's a picture of cash at the Fayetteville show. And there's a guy right in front of him in front of the stage. And I want to think it's Bob Wooten. I, mean, I can't confirm this, but it looks kind of like him in profile. Like you just see his head, but I knew he was right up front. So I like to think that, that it is Bob Wooten in this, in this photo. So it was very cool that if this is captured, we, we have the documentation. So that was, that was a very cool thing. Um, and just, again, just as a historian, you're raised to, at least at LSU is like, do your archival research, go through the documents, then write your story based on documents. Like, I, I know that's not how you have to do it, but that's kind of how I did it initially. And that's how I was trained. So I, doing this project was really fun because I could bring in the music. I could, I could analyze a photo. I could, I could analyze uh, an album cover and kind of talk about these things I never would have thought I would have talked about as a historian. So Cash is, is great for so many reasons, but um, once he's kind of like going down these rabbit holes, it can really, really take you a ways out. So it was a, a very fun project. And um, I don't want to run out of, uh, I'm talking a lot about the early part, <laughs> but um, I do want to talk about some other things and, and give you kind of an, an overview of the book, but um, just to kind of briefly talk about the Cummins show, because that's another big part of the Arkansas story with Cash, because it's the only time he played for prisoners in his home state. Cummins was the biggest of the prisons at the time. Um, I mean, nowadays, Arkansas, the prison population is so much bigger than it used to be, but I think Cummins is still probably the biggest. But anyway, um, Cummins was the scene of one of the major scandals when they dug up skeletons. This guy, um, Tom Merton, who they based the movie Brubaker on, he, without, a, without authority, he dug up some skeletons. He thought they were murdered, caused this, this big outcry. Um, so, so Cummins was kind of at the heart of the prison problems and the prison issues. So, that, so that's why Cash went there. He could have gone to Tucker, which is the other one, but Cummins was bigger. It was more of a mixed population. It was more African-American than Tucker was at the time. Um, so it was a big prison with a lot of prisoners. And at this point, things are getting a little better. 
uh, when Cash does the show in April 69, he's kind of setting up um, some buzz for his television show, which would, which would premiere later that year. Uh, but for Arkansas, it was important because after the show, the legislature made this big appropriation for the prisons, the biggest one they'd ever done. So things are starting to turn around. Uh, Rockefeller, you know, he's making some progress. Um, but by the next year, uh, when Rockefeller has to run again, Cash is not there to help out like he was in 68. So Rockefeller definitely could have used that boost because at that point, 1970, Cash is a superstar. I mean, he's probably, I mean, without doubt, the biggest country guy in the country. He's one of the biggest musicians in the world. I mean, he's as big as the Beatles. He's as big as Dylan. Um, so he doesn't go back to help out Rockefeller at that point, um, which is unfortunate for Rockefeller. But Cash had other things to do. He had his TV show. Um, he's, he's still touring really hard. And so there's kind of a gap for a little while in terms of looking at Arkansas and Cash, because in the early 70s, he's busy in Nashville where, where he's doing his show. He's, a he's got his big mansion there. People are coming, celebrities, everyone from Bob Dylan to Shel Silverstein, you, know, you name it, um, they're, they're showing up there. So um, when he's that big, he's not getting back to Arkansas a lot. But kind of as the 70s progress, by 76, Cash's career has cooled off a little bit. Um, he's not as big as he was for you know, the Folsom concert, the San Quentin concert, those albums are huge. He's still really popular, but the show is done, the show is over. Um, but something really spe special happens in 76 because Cash returns to Cleveland County and he plays a show in Ryzen which is ostensibly for the bicentennial. Um, he plays the show in March, but it's the bicentennial year. And Cash is kind of the unofficial ambassador for the bicentennial. He's got, he's got his black suit, but he's got the suit that has like eagles on it. So he, he's sort of this symbol of patriotism at that point. And also a much better dad than he had been for a long time. He has a son in 1970. He's a better dad. He's he's really kind of Mr. America at this stage. So one concert again that I really want to talk about was the '76 show in 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 uh, in Ryzen. It's a big event. There's a parade. There's probably about ten thousand people at the show. Um, it's just a big festival. You know, all kinds of people are there. Cash comes in and plays a show uh, at the high school there down in Ryzen. So this is. This is a homecoming for Cash, very important to him. Again, in the larger uh, Cash story compared to Folsom and San Quentin, those shows, this isn't as big, but uh, I think it was very important to him and it was certainly important to the people of Cleveland County. This is the only time Cash, or this is the first time I should say he played in Cleveland County. So, um, you know, I was from a small town where I grew up and we certainly never had any, I mean, we didn't have a Johnny Cash come out of there, but we, we never had a Johnny Cash come back to play a, a concert. There's nothing like that. So for Ryzen, this is a huge deal. And just kind of one of the many stories I wanted to tell in this. And it's not just a big day and, and a memorable concert for Cash. He does get a song out of this called uh, Riding on the Cotton Belt, which again is really wrapped into his story, his family story. It's kind of a story about his dad uh, riding the rails and working um, down in Kingsland in Cleveland County during the Depression. So again, Cash, he just keeps doing this again and again. There's sort of a personal reason for him to do a show or go to a certain place. And then that turns into another album or another song that, that might have, you know, some, some personal um personal importance behind it for him. So that, that was a story I definitely wanted to tell here too. But um, <laughs> 76 is, is a good year for Cash, but also kind of, he's gonna be going down the roller coaster a little bit after this, because he has his last number one hit in 76, One Piece at a Time, that again, thankfully for me, was written by an Arkansan, even though it wasn't written by Cash. Um, so. Uh, it was a really fun song. It's kind of more that boom chicka boom cash sound. 
uh, to it. They still play it on XM and Outlaw Country and everything. But as you're heading into the 80s, Cash starts having real issues, uh, personal issues, uh, substance abuse issues. He's not selling records the way he had. He's, he's just not really very inspired. Um, he fires Marshall Grant, who was his original bassist. Um, so the, the lineup is changing. He brings in Marty Stewart, but as good as Marty Stewart is, Marty Stewart kind of knows the band's getting kind of big and it's, uh, I don't know, I think he called it something like the Lawrence Welk hour. The band is just like got just kind of soft and, and too big and Cash is employing, you know, a lot of family members. So the production's getting a little out of hand. Um, and so it really kind of takes Cash the entire 1980s to sort of kind of bring it back home, literally and figuratively, kind of strip things back down. Um, I did want to talk about the, the Highwaymen in the book because this is kind of one of the highlights for Cash in the 80s and into uh, the early 90s. He's playing in the super group, the Highwaymen. It's him, Willie Nelson, Chris Christopherson, and Waylon Jennings. And they do a show in Little Rock. They did, they did a lot of a lot of shows. Um, so I kind of wanted to highlight that and, and talk not just about the 80s as a bad time for Cash, because there were some some good things that came out of it. But by the early 90s, he's really kind of floundering. Um, as good as the Highwaymen are, it's not his band. I mean, he's just kind of a celebrity in the celebrity band. So when he's on his own, things are are trickier. He's in he's in Branson for a little bit. That didn't really work out. Um, but in 94, uh, Cash has another one of his big comebacks. And this is really kind of his last comeback. And why I want to talk about this is not just to kind of set the last couple chapters of the Cash story, but um, 94 is when Cash puts out his American Recordings album. And it's just him on acoustic guitar. It's really good seller. I mean, by any standard today, but um, for Cash, it was one of the best selling albums he had had in a long time. And it was successful because it's really just Cash. It's him singing, playing his guitar. He's playing some old songs, but also some newer things. And this sets off the last, not quite a decade, but the last part of his life where he's putting out these American Recordings albums with uh, Rick Rubin, a younger producer. And the first one's all acoustic, but Cash also does some rock albums. Um, he's really, again, he's kind of doing a little bit of everything. But when he kicks off this, this album, the publicity for it, he plays his last show in Cleveland County in Kingsland. So you had the 76 show in Ryzen, but um, this one is in, in Kingsland itself. It's not quite as big as the Rise and Show in 76, but it's a very Arkansas moment, for back, lack of a better phrase. He's in a tent. It's kind of like a revival meeting in a way. He's got this local backing band. He's got his, his family with him. They sing some hymns. He does a couple of songs. He does a meet and greet. Um, again, you know, Cash didn't need to do this, but uh, he's also always kind of thinking of Arkansas and, and thinking of, of giving back uh, as much as he can. He's kind of start, he, not quite having major health issues, but in the 90s, he will start having those health issues. Uh, he, stops, he stops touring in 97 because of his health issues. Uh, and then he's just kind of recording in the studio. But this, uh, this Kingsland show is really kind of the last, like, the last big Arkansas moment for him. And so I definitely wanted to talk about this and talk about all the people involved, the fans, um, you know, the whatever, the teachers, the the people that lived in the area that come out for this. Cause it wasn't just about cash. It was there there's uh this post office cancellation stamp that a local guy had done the artwork for. So that's that's why uh cash was there. But he does this show. Um, and it's kind of a farewell in a way uh, to Arkansas because he's never gonna he's never gonna play Cleveland, Cleveland County again. Um, so 
you know, I, I want to just, you know, bring together a lot of things, try to keep Arkansas at the center of my story as much as I can. And just to kind of wrap up, um, what, what was really helpful was being in Arkansas around the time they were restoring his house, because that opened in 2014. It was in really rough shape. Uh, it's, it's a complicated story, but ASU finally got the house from the owner. It had been privately owned, but it was really falling apart. And they've just done an amazing job uh, restoring the house back to its 1935 appearance and interior too, about as close as you could you could get. Um, so I've been up there to see the new house. Um, I think Roseanne usually comes up maybe once a year or so. She's she's done uh, was at a festival when she was there for that. So the the fact that they opened the house when I was there was really cool, but also it it kind of brought the story full circle for Cash, but also for me too, doing my research. So I could talk about this as kind of a coda to the to the larger story. Um, and again, you know, reclaiming cash for Arkansas. Um, and it's it's not just his house, they've got other uh, New Deal era buildings there. So they've done a really great job just in, in the whole community. Um, I don't know if it'll ever, you know, get back to where it was. It's, ironically, a lot of these Delta towns were more populated doing better financially in the depression than they are now. <laughs> and I think Dyes is, is kind of that, that case. So, so it, it's definitely helping. Um, so, you know, if you, you ever get a chance to see the, that house, uh, if you do Graceland one day and then you have time to go up to Dyes, you, you absolutely should. But uh, I know it's a long way from Fayetteville, but I wanted to, to, to really kind of bring in as much as of Arkansas as I could. So, I've got my Fayetteville story. I've got my Mississippi County story. You kind of get the four corners and everything in between with Arkansas here. So, um, you know, this is, you know, I'm, I'm trying to tell a story, add to the scholarship on cash. I think there's a lot of, a lot more books that could be written about him, but I wanted to kind of bring together maybe some of the better popular scholarship and also some of the more academic scholarships. So I uh, didn't want to kill people with footnotes, but I also wanted to show off my research a bit, but um, there's really a lot more about Cash to tell. I don't know if I'll write another Johnny Cash book, but I, I will probably be writing about him again before, before too long. Um, but, um, but yeah, it was a long project, but a fun one. So uh, that's all I have to say. Thanks for, for listening, everybody. If there's questions, I know I've gone kind of long here, but if we have questions, I'd love to answer some. No, no. Thank you, Colin. No, you haven't gone too long at all. Okay. So um, if anybody does have a question, please go ahead and type them in the uh, chat or um, there's, I think, enough of us here that we could, uh, you could unmute or raise your hand or however you want to do it. Um, I'll start with a question. You were talking about the um, the museum. Now, is his house going to be the museum or are those two separate things, um, two separate organizations? It's, yeah, it's part, I mean, um, ASU has done a lot of these revitalizations. They did Lakeport Plantation down on the Delta, closer to Louisiana. They did um, the Hemingway House and Piggott. So it's, I don't know if it's open every day, but there's the Cash House, which was about two miles west of the center of town, which is not big, but you can get a tour of the house. The house has been restored. And then there's the, uh, the old New Deal era administration building at the center of town. So, excuse me. I, I mean, collectively, it's all kind of one museum. Okay. Um, obviously the, the Nashville museum is a totally different thing. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, but that's worth seeing too. I've been there too. That's great. Um, I, oddly, I don't know, maybe he just wasn't in Memphis long enough. I feel like more should be happening in Memphis. Um, it should have been where the rock and roll hall of fame was and that didn't, <laughs> I feel like you can go to the Sun Studios; it's still there, and you can you can get a tour there. But uh, 
the cash house is really one of a kind. Um, I have not been to Tupelo to see Elvis's house, but the cash house is really cool. I mean, his mom's piano is in there. There's some original furnishings, but they were painstaking. So it really is, it, it's, it's kind of like a, it's a time machine. It's really great. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm gonna have to make a trip down there now. Just and it's a bit of a drive so to Fayetteville, but it's okay. if you're ever <laughs> out that way, I think it's definitely worth it. There's a question um, or a comment. Let's see. Hotspur's wondering what's the most interesting or surprising thing that you uncovered during your research? Was there any discovery that stood out to you in particular? Yeah, I, it's it's weird when you when you've been involved in a project for so long and then you kind of think, what did I know exactly before I started this? And I knew a little about his music. I had like a a three CD box set. Uh, I'd seen Walk the Line, so I didn't know a lot. I I, I think I'd read his autobiography, the later one. Um, so a lot of it was very new to me. I think. You know, as I, as I talked about tonight, I, I think the Wooten story was was one of the, the most surprising things. I mean, again, just it's, it just doesn't happen. I mean, and it's not something you see in Walk the Line, which, OK, you know, Walk the Line is great, but it stops right about 68. So you have all this later stuff in Cash's life that isn't chronicled in that movie. And I know they can't do everything, but it kind of stops before Bob Wooten comes on board. So I'm like, you know, poor Bob Wooten, he was, he was in the band for much longer than Luther Perkins was, but they did not have him in the movie at all. Um, so, you know, telling the Bob Wooten story, absolutely. And that was totally surprising to me. I think the the concerts for Rockefeller were, were surprising to me too. Um, I, I, I mean, I don't know uh, if any musician had, laid for a governor like that before then. I mean, someone of that stature playing for his home state governor. I mean, maybe it maybe it happened before. I don't I don't know. But that whole story of of, of that series of concerts um again was was interesting but also surprising that he would do that. Um I mean he did get paid. It wasn't like when he played for prisoners he would do that for free, but that he would do, you know, half dozen shows for the governor because he liked his politics for cash or I mean for anyone it might be unusual of, of that stature but for cash it was also unusual because he didn't he didn't like to be identified with a particular party I think he he leaned left in his politics but he claimed he never voted um, he was very conservative in a lot of ways but also kind of progressive but just doing those shows was was very surprising that that he would do that. Um, so th those were, I'd, I'd say, two of the more surprising things that that came out of it. And and just knowing that we had some photographs and documentation. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, documentation and the audio was really surprising to me. Um, so I, yeah, you know, I had to get those things out in the world. Um, but you just. You just never know what you're going to find in, the, in these archives. And a lot of times it's just people, they're begging you to tell these stories. Uh, in, in my case, it was kind of, we were creating this archive. So we kind of had the inside track to a lot of it. But um, yeah, it was, maybe I didn't know a lot about cash, but even for a person who did, we would have had a lot of surprising things in that archive to discover. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the question, Thank Hotspur. Um, I've got a question too about the concert in Fayetteville. Do you know where that was, where that concert was held at the time? Hog Heaven. Hog Heaven. <laughs> hmm, I wonder where that I'm is. Guessing, <laughs> I, I don't know exactly where that is. I'm guessing it's near the college campus. I think something someone, on campus, maybe. Yeah, okay. I, I'm not okay. sure exactly. Um, but that's that was the descriptive name to it, whatever that is. Okay, yeah, everything um, around here is hog something. Oh, so. Okay. <laughs> so that'll put me on my own research project yeah, I, to find I, out where I, that was. Yeah, I, I should have gotten a more like GPS exact location for it because <laughs> um, 
sometimes in these photos, you don't really know where exactly he is. I mean, you might have the, the city, but they all kind of look the same after a while. Um, but yeah, hog heaven, whatever that is. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah, there were several, you know, back at that time, several smaller venues okay. and stuff too around town. So he could be anywhere. I've got another question for you. Um, but if anybody else does, please jump in so I don't, you know, take up all the time. I'd like to know um, if you have a favorite Johnny Cash song, especially one that is uh, specific or, you know, inspired by his time in Arkansas. Yeah, I think probably like a lot of people, I like the early stuff the best. I think he does a lot of good stuff in the 90s, really throughout. I mean, there's always good songs, great songs. Um, it, it, it kind of changes. Um, sometimes I might, you know, not want to hear a certain song because I've heard it so many times or heard it on the radio recently. But I'm kind of partial to his version of Rock Island Line. I really, really like that um, because he does so much in two minutes and whatever, 20 seconds or whatever. I mean, it's it's such a short song, but it's it's like a story and it's got tempo changes and he does this, this kind of verbal somersaults at the end when he's just like talking really fast. I mean, it's just, it's just phenomenal. And that none of these guys are trained. I mean, they're just, they figured it out like a lot of garage bands. Um, they just, they just hit the ground running at Sun. Um, but I, I really like his very first album. That's on his first album. He wasn't really album uh, centric until later. Like you just didn't, people didn't care about albums necessarily. You kind of do singles and then they get compiled later. But the, the version of Rock Island Line, I think, is the best one I've ever heard. And, and it just, it, it doesn't sound like it's lost anything. And whatever it is now, 70, almost 70 years old. So I, I really like that. That that one is one of my favorites. I like, uh, you know, getting a lot of the Sun stuff. But there's um, this one he does in the 60s for one of his concept albums called 25 Minutes to Go which is really dark because it's about a guy who's going to be executed, but it's a funny song. It's a Shel Silverstein song. I, I like that one a lot, um, but th you know, there are a ton, there are a ton of them. Um, so I'd hate to have to pick one, but I think right now I would say rock on online, which he didn't write. Um, if you want to talk about songs that he wrote, I might have some others, but just in terms of him as an artist, as a performance that that one, I like the most. Today. Well, thank you. Don't mean to put you on the spot. No, no, <laughs> you no, can, no. You can have more than one favorite. That's okay. <laughs> I think everyone, I, that's the cool thing about Johnny Cash and his fans. I think if you ask 100 people, you get a lot of different answers. Um, yeah. And it, it may be, you know, like you said, too, you know, the time, the time, your, your uh, mood, you know. Yeah. Where, you know, yeah. It really, there's a little something for everyone. And um, this this is a weird thing too, but I think about it a lot. Um, it sounded better in Arkansas. <laughs> I, I just, the listening to it, I mean, I still, I still love his music. It still sounds great, but like listening to it in Arkansas, I was more in it then. Um, Cause it's, you know, that is where he grew up, but you're also kind of close to Memphis and there's just a vibe, there's a different vibe there. So listening a lot more country, uh it was, was great um but it it sounded better in arkansas <laughs> thank you thank you for trying to reclaim him again for arkansas i like <laughs> sure. this I, that's a, that's a project i can get on board with there's another yeah. comment um in the chat section for being such a accomplished songwriter he was also an incredible interpretive singer and i i agree yeah that, that's a great comment yeah that's and that th that's rock island line for you i mean it's it's not his song but um, a lot of people have been doing it and I think he, he did it the best. And I think with Cash again and again, he'll take someone's song and then it's his. Um, and yeah, I think he does some of the definitive versions of very uh, tried and true songs. I mean, I think his version of Ghost Riders in the Sky, which he, he does much later in the late seventies. I think that's the best version I've heard. I, I love that version, but he didn't write that one. 
Um, but this will happen a lot in the American recordings period. He'll, he, he is writing some new stuff, but not a lot. But I think a lot of people would maybe say their favorite Cash song, or at least his, their favorite interpretive song is Hurt, which is a Nine Inch Nails song, but Cash takes it, makes it acoustic, and really just, you know, fleshes out all the emotion in that. So, yeah, I mean, he's doing it right up till the end. Some of the things don't work for me on American recordings, but most of it does. And I think it's, some of it's his best work. So, yeah, not just writing his own stuff, but doing other people's songs really well. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you for the comments and the questions. I'm going to attempt a technology thing here and try to okay. share my screen and okay. uh, <laughs> just show that um, here is the cover of the book. Of course, we have the book at the library. And um, you can, but if you need to get a, a copy of your own, you can certainly do that at our local bookstore at Pearl's Books and um, through the University of Arkansas Press website um, or an 800 number there. And I'll put in another plug for uh, American Rambler for the podcast. Um, Colin, I noticed that you have some Arkansas folks on, on uh, your podcast and talk about some other Arkansas topics. Was that inspired by your time yeah. here? Oh yeah, absolutely. And I'm I'm still talking to people, still keeping in touch. Um, I had John Kirk on not too long ago, who's a professor down in Little Rock, and he wrote a book on Rockefeller. We were, you know, we were there together for a few years. Um, and so yeah, I've I've had some Johnny Cash related people, but then yeah, just a lot of Arkansas scholars, you name it. So if if you know someone who didn't hear this talk, I I've done other podcasts on there they're pretty much a book talk it was before, before the book came out so they can they can go back through the archives there if they want and, and listen to something similar but yeah I have had a lot of Arkansans on so that's been cool well, thank you thank you again um you. any other comments or questions from anyone if and if not we'll we'll go ahead and wrap up for this evening and Colin I appreciate your time very very much very interesting. <laughs> thank you, Renee. Thank you. And, um, thanks, thanks everyone for attending. And uh, if you buy the book, I hope you enjoy it. So thank you. All right. Thanks. All right. Good, Good night, night everybody. Bye-bye.